This presentation is on evaluation of concrete gravity structures. Um, so just a quick outline of the presentation. I'll discuss the objectives, run through some key concepts, discuss a couple of case, historical case histories, and then do a comparison of some standard design and risk analyses, noting some similarities and some differences, and then go into a little bit more detail of a, a typical analysis that you would run for a risk-based um, evaluation, but you wouldn't necessarily consider for design purposes. And then those be a couple of event trees that I'll um, run through uh, for normal flood and seismic loading, and then the rest of the presentation will focus on how to evaluate the risk associated with seismic loading. So the objectives are to understand the mechanisms that affect the potential gravity structure failure, um, to be able to construct an event tree and then evaluate the probabilities associated with the nodes of that event tree related to failure of a concrete gravity structure. There's a, a caveat um, that I wanna put on this presentation. Um, sometimes potential failure modes for gravity structures are lumped into either internal or global failure modes. Internal failure modes refer to instability or sliding within the concrete you know, structure itself, whereas global failure modes are related to sliding along the foundation contact or deeper within the foundation. This presentation is only going to focus on the internal failure modes and global at the foundation contact. Any instability related to um, weak planes within the foundation are covered in other chapters within best practices. And if the gravity dam is founded on alluvial foundations, then the, you're gonna to wanna to refer to the internal erosion section of best practices. So what are some key concepts? So gravity structures rely on their mass for stability. Weak lift joints are the rock foundation contact or potential failure planes of weakness um, that you're gonna to wanna to consider within the evaluation. The joint cleanup and the placement of the concrete are gonna be critical to understand the potential failure along these surfaces. The foundation rock um, is typically rough and depending upon the construction method, it could have high strength um, because of the roughness, but this is still going to be a, a sliding surface that you're gonna wanna consider within the evaluation. Even if it ends up not being the controlling one, it's still a critical plane that you're gonna wanna evaluate. Changes in slope or geometry, particularly within the um, cross section of the, the structure itself are gonna be locations of high stress concentrations. Existing crack patterns can affect the behavior and you're gonna to wanna to pay attention um, to where they're located. Um, drains are the, generally the first line of defense when considered um, stability of a structure. Selection of the strength parameters and the analysis techniques are going to be very important in understanding um, the potential for failure. Um, and we'll go into different analysis techniques later, farther down into the presentation and how can we use those to develop nodal probabilities. Um, limit states, particularly related to um, simplified stability analysis, does not equate to failure within a risk assessment. There's going to be other things that will need to be considered, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. Um, and lastly, shear keys or key joints can aid in stability by using load transfer um, if a particular cross section is thought to be unstable for particular loading. This is a a quick example of uh, key joints between monoliths that can allow for low transfer if a particular monolith is unstable. Um, basically, they can the monoliths will interact with each other, and this is an um, example of things to consider within a risk assessment. So let's run through a couple of case histories. Um, the first one is Bouze Dam, which is in France. It was a 72 foot high gravity masonry structure um, that had a little over six and a half foot wide cutoff key that varied between 20 and 33 feet deep on the upstream face, which is you know, highlighted here uh, on the upstream side. During the initial filling, the pool reached within 33 feet of the crest and spring started to be noticed on the downstream of the dam. Initially um, passing flow with a estimated about 800 gallons per minute. As the, dam, as the reservoir continued to rise such that it was within 24 feet of the crest, the seepage was noted to be even greater and estimated to be about 1,200 gallons per minute. And then when the pool reached within about 10 feet of the crest, there was a 400 foot section of the dam that shifted downstream. 
The maximum amount of movement was a little over a foot and it caused a crack on the upstream face that sheared through the upstream, uh, the upstream cutoff wall noted by the, the dashed lines in this figure. After the event, the dam was then strengthened with a buttress that increased the cross section on the bottom third of the, the structure. They then added a masonry course on the upstream face to seal the crack, and then they added um, a clay layer to help yeah, minimize the seepage. After the construction was done, the pool yeah, rose again and was within two feet of the crest, at which point the, a section that was 33 feet yeah, high and 560 feet long catastrophically failed above the, the portion of the dam that was strengthened. Basically noted by the, the hash section in this figure, yeah, this section you know, developed a crack yeah, that then you know, allowed for the a section to catastrophically fail above the, the strengthened portion of the dam. Essentially, a failure was attributed to a crack developing on the upstream face due to the moment that was generated um, from the load, yeah, particularly at that, you know, just above the section that was strengthened, that crack then propagated all the way through the narrow section and there wasn't enough shear strength along that sliding plane to resist movement of that, you know, section of the, the dam. And it ended up resulting in 100, 100, roughly 100 fatalities downstream. So the next case history I'll discuss is Kona Dam, uh, which is located in the southwest region in India. It's a 340-foot high dam, 2,800 feet long, yeah, straight gravity dam. It's approximately 50 feet thick at the crest with a 225-foot thick section and in the valley section um, at the base. It has a 300-foot wide spillway in the center, and there was a construction modification that resulted in steepening the downstream slope of the upper portion of the dam. In December of 1976, the project was subjected to a 6.5 magnitude earthquake that had an epicenter within 13 kilometers of the dam and a fault break that was within three kilometers. The project experienced yeah, approximately six seconds of strong ground motion and it measured a PGA at the base of the dam of about 0.63 parallel to the structure, a little less than 0.5 in the transverse direction and a little more than 0.3 in the vertical. At the time of the event, the pool was within 12 kilometers of the crest. Cracking was noted um, on both the upstream and downstream face of the, the non-overflow monoliths, um, with the majority of the cracking located on the downstream slope right around the slope change that was modified during construction. The most severely damaged uh, monolith was the transition monolith between the spillway and the non-overflow monoliths, and um, the non-overflow monoliths actually experienced very little damage, where the, most of the, the cracking was noted within the non-overflow monoliths. After the event, a finite element analysis was developed to evaluate um, the, the tensile stresses within the dam to see if we could mimic the damage that was noted um, after the event. And essentially, the finite element analysis showed that the tensile stresses were approximately 400 PSI, whereas the concrete tensile strength was only estimated to be about 300, 350 PSI, noting why, why we so, saw so much cracking, particularly at the slope changes. After the event, the, the dam was then strengthened using buttresses on the downstream face, which is shown in the, the, the bottom figure within this slide. So now moving on to some comparison of some typical design and risk analyses. So from a, a design perspective, the analysis are generally going to be deterministic. And a lot of times you're going to incorporate factors of safety that uh, increase your loading and decrease the resistance of the structure. You're going to want to consider you know, the O&M needs as well as the dam safety needs um, within the design. And a lot of times you'll allow for lower factors of safety for the more infrequent loads that you consider. And most of the designs are gonna focus in on those infrequent loads. It's typically not your normal loading that will control your design. Um, it's very typical that, you know, and generally required that at least one load case that's considered within a, um, a design that the drains be considered to be completely ineffective. And a lot of times you're going to want to consider lower bound values when related to your resisting force, in particular, the shear strength parameters along the foundation contact. It's very um, uncommon to consider any interlocking or side friction within a design. Um, and the ultimate limit state for design is a factor of safety less than one. And 
it's uncommon to consider past performance within the design. Generally, you have you know, your required loadings, you have a, a cross section that you think is necessary in order for it to be stable. And the, you use the information related to the site specific to come up with some of your parameters, but any you know, past performance um, of maybe surrounding projects in a similar environment generally don't come into play. And depending upon the designer and the project, you may consider some three-dimensional effects, but that's not very typical within the design. On a, from a risk analysis perspective, however, the analyses are always probabilistic and you never want to apply safety factors. We want to know exactly how the structure is going to respond or is as best as we can. And so we want to know exactly what is the loading that's applied and want to account for the full magnitude of the resistance that the structure has um, within a risk assessment. We're going to consider the full range of loadings. We're not going to just focus in on the more infrequent loads and the, the frequency of that loading is going to play a key role in determining whether or not the, the risk associated with failure is considered unacceptable. We're going to want to try to account for side friction or any kind of three dimensional effects when possible within a, a 2D analysis and anything that we can't account for in a risk analysis, we will still want to try and account for and yeah, within a licitation using engineering judgment. And I'll get into a little bit more discussion there when I you know, show an example of entry. The, we're gonna consider the, the full range of values when selecting our parameters. We don't wanna just focus in on the lower bounds and we're gonna put a distribution you know, with a best estimate you know, around those uncertainty parameters and a factor of safety less than one for traditional stability analysis does not equate to failure. You know, as I noted in the, the, the key concepts and I'll discuss them a little bit more, you know, there's there's a lot that goes into stability and there's only so much that you can account for within a 2D analysis. And so just because you have a factor of safety of less than one or you exceed whatever limit state you set doesn't mean that the, the project is going to fail. And past performance is a very important thing to consider when estimating the risk associated with, uh, with structural failure. So there's also some other analyses within a risk assessment that you may want to consider that are not very typical within design. One of those is a cracked base analysis. Um, the reason why we run these types of analysis is a lot of times methodology is geared more towards design and is way too conservative from a risk perspective. And one example of that is from a design perspective, if you develop a crack at the heel um, along this, the sliding plane that you're considering, you would assume you have full uplift within that crack. But that crack is, particularly if it's within the foundation, is going to be yeah, too conservative because generally the foundation permeability is going to be a lot greater than the permeability of the crack. There's actually research to help back this up that was done at the University of Colorado that highlighted that even if you develop a crack that extends beyond a line of drains, that those drains may remain effective, which is typically not a, uh, an assumption we would make from a design perspective, but that can have a, a big impact within our uplift pressures that we consider. Um, another thing about a crack based analysis is that, that your analysis indicates that the section is going to completely crack through. From a design perspective, this is an elimin a limiting case. You would consider this to be failure. From a risk perspective, yeah, that does not necessarily yeah, mean that the structure is going to fail. And so there's things that we're going to want to consider is what impact does that crack have on our uplift pressures? What impact does that you know, a cracked section have on our assumed shear strength parameters? And we're going to want to modify those assumptions and then rerun our analysis to see if the structure is in fact unstable under that loading. And if you then, if you exceed the limit states from a crack based analysis, then you could consider that the structure is un, in, unstable, at least from a 2D perspective. And so this kind of highlights what I was talking about a little bit by the research from the University of Colorado. There's three schematics here. The bottom two are design assumptions, both from the Corps of Engineers and from the Bureau of Reclamation. And they're very similar in that you assume that you have full headwater at the heel, full toe pressure, tailwater at the toe, and then you have a reduction, uh, in, you know, linear reduction between those, except there may be some uh, reduction provided by a line of drains, you know, highlighted there in the center. And as the, the base starts to crack due to um, the loading applied to the structure, you would then assume that you have full headwater within the crack. And if the crack then extends to the line of drains, then um, you would assume that the drains are overwhelmed and you would have no effectiveness from that 
those drains and you would have full uplift um, within that crack and then you know no reduction. The, the research from the University of Colorado is highlighted in the schematic at the top where you have the same starting initial assumptions, but once you start developing a crack at the base, you know you don't necessarily have full headwater once the crack extends beyond the line of drains. The drains are assumed to be have some amount of efficiency based on the research they show, and you can see just how much of an impact that can have in the uplift profile and the, the last column between these these two. And it can be a major difference between the structure being considered unstable or stable, um, and it's something that we're going to want to account for uh, at least the potential within a risk assessment that we wouldn't necessarily consider in a design. So another thing we want to keep in mind is when we're evaluating internal sliding planes, we need to identify what are the, cr the critical planes on which the structure could slide. And that generally that's going to want to focus in on what lift joints do we think are potentially unbonded. And a very common thing to do is to look at the downstream face and see where do we see seepage coming from lift joints, and we would and then just assume that those that seepage is a result of an unbonded lift joint. But that's not necessarily going to be the case. And a couple examples: uh, one is Fry Ant Dam, um, which you know, on the downstream face there are numerous you know, notices of seepage and leaky lift joints. But when they took cores from within the dam, they noticed that all of those lift lines were actually intact. Whereas Stuart, Stuart Mountain Dam, you know, it has very few um, signs of leaks or seepage on the downstream face. But again, when they took cores from that dam, they did notice yeah, multiple joints that were weak or unbonded, at least in, you know, within the cores that they took. And so we can't necessarily just rely on where do we see seepage on the downstream face. You're really going to want to dig into the construction records and get a feeling for how were those joints prepared and were they, you know, was the, the construction proper such that we would expect that the, the joints to be bonded. And examples of some good you know, joint treatment during construction is was there water curing of the top list? Did they do any sandblasting prior to placing the next you know, concrete? Or did they use richer mixes that had smaller aggregates on the top portion of the, the cured concrete? And were there proper vibration techniques during construction? And all of that, yeah, if there's signs that you know, those weren't, they don't meet current standards or they didn't do a good job of doing that, that could be an indication of where you might have you know, an unbonded lift joint or at least a, a joint that isn't you know, completely bonded across the entire section. So now getting into you know, some example of entries. The first one I'll start with is for normal and flood loading. And this event tree is a little simplified in that. So the first node we have is related to the loading, which is very typical. But the, at the preceding node is we're generally just lumping all of the nodes related to instability. And really what we would do in practice is we would separate this out into at least two different nodes. Um, the first node would be related to uh, the probability of exceeding your limit state for you know, a particular um, failure mechanism such as sliding or overturning and that would be informed by a probabilistic 2d analysis and kind of you know getting back to the comparison between design and risk uh, analysis you incorporate all the things related to that within a simplified analysis and you know generate a probability and use that to inform the likelihood of overcoming or you know, being unstable from a 2D perspective. But then you're also going to want to have a node that accounts for all the things that you know are difficult to quantify in a stability analysis. And we generally just consider that 3D effects. And we would evaluate that using engineering judgment as part of an elicitation. And that could include things such as side friction or any kind of yeah, arching action that might you know, exist between as uh, a monolith tries to slide out. If there, is there any additional um, resistance within the foundation that may help you know are the joints not perfectly aligned with the direction of movement such that maybe the models would tend to slide into each other instead of directly downstream and we would kind of consider all of those within the 3d effects node and so um, that those are that's kind of an, a, a typical um, event tree that we would consider particularly for flood loading the next event tree that I'm presenting is related to, you know, particularly for overtopping of a dam or flow over a spillway section. Is there any impact for erosion or scour on the downstream end? And so the, the event tree that we have shown here is very similar to the one I showed previously, except in between the load and the instability node, we have a node related to what is the impact of the erosion. 
And some things that we want to keep in mind when we're evaluating these types of failure modes is what is the impact that the water flowing over the structure have to our resisting forces? Does it have the ability to push our tail water downstream, resist, you know, reducing the, the magnitude of that resisting force? Are there any crest pressures, you know, if you're dealing with a spillway section, such that as the water flows over it, is it going to add additional resistance or could it create negative pressures around the crest that could help you know, initiate a crack at the heel that you know, could make this, the structure more unstable? What's the potential for erosion downstream? It, it, particularly if the structure is, um, the stability is highly dependent upon a passive wedge, do you have the ability to erode that passive wedge from water flowing over the structure? Could you end up eroding farther down into the foundation such that you expose a weaker plane that you may not actually consider without the erosion because it, it's so deep and you'd have to shear through, it would create you know, a large passive wedge that you would have to overcome. But if you erode down and expose that, you know, maybe that's a weaker plane that now comes into play that wouldn't under normal loading. And so the last event tree that I'm going to um, present is related to seismic loading and the rest of the presentation will focus on how to evaluate the nodes related to um, seismic failure modes. And so the beginning of the event tree is actually very similar to the, the, the two nodes that or two event trees that I presented before. You know, it's related to the loading of the structure. You know, you have the, uh, the probability of the pool loading, and this also incorporates the likelihood of the, the ground motion that you're considering. The rest of the event tree is where things start to um, deviate and you know so we have the next nodes are what's the potential for the section to completely crack through you know is that cracking then going to have any disruption on the drains and could that impact the uplift assumptions that we're considering and then the last node that we present here is what is the post earthquake instability and so we haven't shown a node related to failure of the structure during the event and that's something you absolutely need to consider um, but that's very similar to you know, the methods of evaluating that are you know somewhat similar to what in the previous node so we're trying to highlight where are the differences and so there's a node in there you will need to consider but you'll uh, with an earthquake you also want to consider what is the potential for instability after the event occurs you know do you damage the structure enough that it will no longer be able to resist the static loading you know once the ground starts stops shaking and so here are some things to, that we want to keep in mind when we're evaluating the risk associated with yeah, earthquakes. Um, one is that a lot of times we're going to need to go to a time history finite element analysis in order to truly appreciate the response that the structure would have during an earthquake. You know, simplified 2B, 2D stability analysis that are done with spreadsheets a lot of times aren't going to be able to you know, consider all of the things that are going on in, in play with a, an earthquake. Amplification thr uh, through the structure and damping at the site are going to be also important considerations when evaluating stability. And then, you know, as noted in the event tree, we're going to want to know what's the likelihood of cracking through the section. Are we going to get enough displacement that we uh, impact our drains and maybe adjust, uh, and that results in a change in our uplift assumptions? The other thing about displacements, um, just because you get a little displacement doesn't mean the structure is going to fail. And it gets back to the notion that, you know, just because we exceed a limit state doesn't equate to failure from a risk perspective. You know, you got to get enough displacement that you actually get an uncontrolled release of the structure. And so tracking the magnitude of your displacements is going to be very important in evaluating what's the likelihood of actually failing a concrete gravity dam due to seismic loading. And then you're going to want to consider what is the, the stability after the earthquake, particularly if you have a damaged section. And so the next set of um, slides I'm going to run through just kind of highlights how do we take the information that comes out of a finite element analysis and turn that into a probability. We generally are going to have to go to this level of study in order to adequately understand the response. but finite element analysis are inherently deterministic. And so we can't necessarily, they're not gonna give us a probability of cracking through the section or you know, disrupting the drain. And so we're just gonna have to, we need to find a way to take the information that does provide and turn that into a probability. And for this particular example, we have a cross section that was taken through a finite element analysis of six monoliths and the magenta color here identifies where we exceeded the tensile capacity and where cracking is assumed. 
And one thing to note here is only one of the six monoliths act actually completely cracked through. And so that can you know, tell us something about what's the likelihood of being able to crack through the section and what's the likelihood of ultimately failing the dam. So how do we take that information and turn it into a probability? One of the, the easiest ways is to kind of put together some factors that make it more or less likely that you would actually, in this case, crack through. And so an adverse factor based on the information we have is that the tensile stresses on the upstream face are estimated to be greater than our tensile capacity, particularly for the, the upper load ranges. And, and note when we were talking about the differences between design and risk analysis, for risk analysis, we're going to consider the full the range of loading. And so for this particular example, the upper load range is actually exceeded our tensile capacity. But for a less likely factor, maybe for the more frequent load ranges, maybe you don't exceed that tensile capacity. And maybe those, based on the likelihood of those um, loadings, they may have a bigger impact on the risk to the structure. And so that's something to, to keep in mind. And so, you know, you may have factors that are associated for various different types of, of loadings yeah, as you're trying to estimate what's the probability of, in this case, cracking through. Another um, more adverse factor could be that the cracks may propagate more readily than what the nonlinear analysis accounts for. All analysis have to make certain assumptions, even you know, nonlinear finite element analysis. And so some of the assumptions may be considered a little bit more conservative depending upon how you set up the model. And so you know, those cracks, maybe they'll propagate more faster than what the, the model is you know, considering. At the same time, if your particular model is assuming that the joints are unbonded at the beginning of the earthquake, that may be a, a less likely factor because maybe in reality you have coring that shows that you have good bond between the joints. And you know, yeah, how you account for the tensile capacity along that plane will be very important in determining what's the likelihood of cracking through. And then in, in this particular example, you know, also the nonlinear analysis only showed that one monolith actually completely cracked all the way through. And so there may actually be some interplay between monoliths that's not well captured that may actually hold help, you know, limit the amount of cracking of that one particular monolith. So there may be some three-dimensional aspects that you would want to consider when evaluating what's the likelihood of cracking through. Another example output is, for, is a displacement plot, and this particular example highlights how much displacement we see at various um, nodes within the, the finite element model and, you know, and how that varies with time. And we can use this information to determine how much is the cross section actually going to move and what impact might that have to the drains and our uplift assumptions. And even if we don't have a nonlinear finite element analysis to use to evaluate this, you can there's some more simplified analysis that you can do, such as Newmark analyses. These analysis, the Newmark analysis, tend to be more conservative because it's a, you're required to assume that the section is completely cracked through at the beginning of the event. Whereas a nonlinear finite element, you might have be able to assume that there's a certain tensile capacity at the start of the event. And so you can, if you don't have a nonlinear finite element analysis, you can use new mark, but you just need to understand those inherently are going to be more conservative in the, the amount of displacement that they estimate. So how do we take this information and turn this into a probability? We can do the same thing that we did with um, the potential for cracking through and develop some more and less likely factors. And for this example, an, you know, an adverse factor may be that the nonlinear analysis shows that we have displacements greater than the drain diameter. But maybe those are only for the upper load ranges. Maybe for the more frequent load ranges, we have much less displacement such that we wouldn't expect any impact to our uplift assumptions. And that could be a less likely factor. A more adverse factor could be that dilation on the sliding plane could increase uplift even if we don't you know, actually displace the drains. And so we may not need as much displacement depending upon you know, at the plane that you're considering and the ground motions that you have at the site. Nonlinear analysis um, may actually also assume that you're completely cracked through at the beginning of the earthquake, you know, which would be a less likely factor, particularly if you have information that shows that the joint is actually well bonded. And so you, all of these information you can you know, use to kind of use engineering judgment to decide, well, what do we think is the likelihood that we would get enough displacement that we would impact our uplift assumptions? <laughs> 
And then lastly, um, the, the thing I'll talk about is evaluating the, the post earthquake instability. This is going to be largely dependent upon how much damage the structure sees, which is very uncertain because the event actually hasn't occurred unless the, the project has seen an earthquake of that magnitude and you actually can you have documented you know, damage after the event. And so in order to evaluate the the post earthquake instability, we're going to have to make some assumptions on the amount of damage. And so there's several scenarios that you're going to want to run through. Initially, you're going to want to look at, well, what is the um, stability associated with a partially cracked section? Say the crack doesn't go all the way through the section. And so you have a portion of the concrete that's still intact and able to resist um, the movement of the structure. And you want to look at it basically adjust your assumptions based on a partially cracked section instead of a completely intact section and then evaluate what's the stability then you also want to assume well what if the crack extends all the way through the structure but it doesn't actually we don't get any displacement or not enough displacement to impact the drainage and so our uplift assumptions would remain the same what impact does that have on stability related to the static loading and then the last scenario you want to look at is not only do you completely crack through but then you get enough displacement that you actually impact the your uplift assumptions and reevaluate stability you know, for that scenario and then you'll use all of this information and the information that you know what's the likelihood you know how much damage do you think you might see based on the information that you got out of your finite element analysis to determine well what's the likelihood that the structure would then be unstable after the event based on the static loading that would be applied to it and so lastly so what are some takeaway points from all of this um, basically stress concentrations or weak joints are key locations of potential um, instability within a gravity structure that you're going to want to focus in on for a risk assessment and you know you may have to consider multiple planes and you know which you want to evaluate in terms of potential sliding the foundation contact may not be the um, controlling um, you know, plane that you want to consider it may be it may have a lot of strength there you know particularly if it's, it was a very rough surface you know the way they constructed it but it's still a a surface that you're going to want to consider within the, the risk assessment. Many evaluations rely on probabilistic limit state analysis and particularly seismic analysis rely on a lot of different analysis and you're going to have to bring all of that information together. And so a lot of times you really just need to rely on your engineering judgment based on what the analysis are telling you in order to estimate the probabilities for each of the nodes within the event tree to understand what's the risk associated with failure given that the loading occurs.